Welcome to the Fit Dad Nation podcast, forging strong fathers and raising a stronger generation. It's time to get up or shut up with your host, Steve Roy. Hey guys, this is Steve Roy, the host of the Fit Dad Nation podcast. Welcome to the show. Thank you for listening. So today, uh, before we get in, in, into the show, um, I just want to take a quick moment, invite all you dads who are listening right now and who are ready to start taking action on reclaiming your health and fitness and becoming better fathers and better men to join our online community. Uh, and the best way to do that is to head over to Facebook and apply to our private group, the Fit Dad Base Camp. So that's uh, just facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Fit Dad Base Camp. So um, my guest today is someone who popped up on my radar recently, um, and his name is Larry Bellotta. And uh, Larry is a marriage expert and coach, and he's the founder of YouCanSaveThisMarriage.com. And he's got quite an interesting story um, and perspective on marriage because he spent 27 years in a, a terrible marriage and one that was literally on the brink of divorce. And, and he chose to find a solution uh, instead of hanging it up. So uh, now he's been married for more than 40 years, wonderful relationship with his wife, and he helps men and women save their own marriages. So, you know, I'm, I'm actually really interested in speaking with him on a personal level because, you know, I'm a divorced father. I suffered through a, a toxic eight and a half year marriage. Um, and I specifically work with dads, uh, many of whom uh, are divorced. So Larry, thank you so much for being here. Well, Steve, I'm really glad to be here because uh, uh, we are kindred spirits. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we were talking a little bit before we uh, we started up, and um, yeah, we we have a lot of um, similarities in in who we're trying to help, and some of our stories, even our backstories, um, overlap. So I'm just really interested in in getting into this, and I know what you have to say and some of your 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 philosophies and your principles are going to be extremely helpful for not just married dads, uh, but divorced dads as well. So uh, and speaking of divorced dads and speaking of divorce, um, I, I want to I start with these two foundation ideas. Um, a, a, a man treats his wife the way his father treated his mother in his first 10 years, and a wife treats her husband the way her mother treated her father in the first 10 years. And so when you want to ask the question like, well, that's a little disorienting. I don't quite follow that. And okay, well then here, let's, let's look at it this way. Let's imagine that your mother or your father was forced to live with her mother for a year in the same house. What would happen? And so when you think of it that way, you know, if you think about your first wife, and you think about your father being forced to live with her mother in the same house for a year, what do you think would happen? Um, yeah, I don't think it would be great. <laughs> All right. Well, there's some people who know the father and mother really well, uh -huh. and they know their history. And when you, when they hear that question, like they, they respond with a, oh my goodness, that would be a nightmare. Yeah. All right. Well, here's the point of this, this story. The nightmare is being carried within you. If it would be a nightmare, Why? It's because the mother's value system and the father's value system are in absolute clashing readiness. They're ready to crash into each other on a moment's notice. And, uh, and so that's uh, like uh, my father and, and Marsha's mother uh, were so opposite that they wouldn't even acknowledge that each other existed, let alone come to any wedding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were just absolutely completely opposite. They had so nothing in common that they couldn't even speak about each other, let alone to each other. <laughs> so my father had a value system and her mother had a value system. My father put that value system in me. Her mother put that value system in her. her and so now we come together in the same house. So what are we really doing? We're now bringing my father's value system and her mother's value system into the same house. And it's called marriage. All right, now we don't know any of this. When I marry Marsha in the 70s, I don't know anything about this. I don't know that I'm carrying the value system of my father. And my father was really self-centered, really a real self-centered guy. And he really was just really all his whole world revolved around himself. And uh, he couldn't be much of a father because of that. So I didn't know any of that. I didn't know that I was going into a marriage and I was going to be my father in the marriage. So what, what does that mean, be my father? Well, in my father's case, I can look at some highlights. My father was uh, 
into a lot of activities. Like he loved horse race gambling. <laughs> okay. uh, he, he was a teacher, right? And he would leave the school and he'd go right to the racetrack. <laughs> so he was a quirky guy. And uh-huh. so what am I? I'm a quirky guy. And I tend to have addictions because he had addictions. See, so all those things transfer over, you know, I want to be the center of attention. Why? Because my father was the center of attention. So that was me. Okay. So I want to be the center of attention. I'm quirky. I'm self-centered and I am going to carry that in. But the problem is Larry doesn't know that he has no idea that he is carrying his father. So he marries Marsha. Okay. So what's Marsha bringing? Well, she's bringing in her mother. And what is her mother? Number one, super hard worker, super busy, always doing things and sarcastic and has a nasty temper. (laughs) Okay. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, you can already see that with my father's value system, I'm really into myself because my father's into himself. She's combative. What do you think is going to happen? She's going to bring me combat. I'm going to want to run away and do my own thing. There it is. How easy that is, right? Mm -hmm. But because we grow up in a world that says your childhood doesn't matter, it's past, the past is past, who cares about it, just forget it, it doesn't matter. That's not true. Your childhood is being carried in you. And when you're in your 20s, you're in the peak of your life force. And when you're, it's your peak of your life force in your 20s from 19 years old to 30 years old, you are fully yourself. And the programs of your childhood really don't, you don't know anything about them and you're really not interested in them. You, you don't even see them. But when you hit 30, what happens is your life force starts to decrease and the programs of childhood start to increase. They start to get stronger. So all of the messages of your childhood start growing and getting stronger. And what they start to do is they start to push inside you for expression. And that's when it begins. It begins when you're in your 30s. And it really reaches a peak when you're 35, 40 years old. And so that's the time when whatever your father was, you are going to be. And here's the scary part. You're not going to know it. You're not going to know it. You're not going to see it. Why? It's like being possessed, just like a horror movie. It's just like being possessed. You're taken over by your father. You act out. You, you know, th- that's why in marriages, the, the comic sarcasm is you're just like your mother. You're just like your father. And that's never a compliment. It's always mm-hmm. an insult, right? What they're saying is you're the worst of your father. You're the worst of your mother. That's what they're saying. But you don't know it. We just don't know it. We can't, because we're not aware. We're not even in a society that wants to be aware. So, and, and the idea of being possessed while you're in a marriage, that's so scary. Nobody wants to talk about that. Nobody wants to hear about it. So the people who want to hear my message are the people who have already crashed and burned, right? Their marriage has already collapsed. Or uh, their spouse uh, is in a midlife crisis. Now, what's that? A midlife crisis is when the childhood, whatever the abuse, uh, abandonment, and neglect is, whatever combination, physical or, men, or, or, or emotional, it comes and literally takes over the woman's personality. And then I'm constantly hearing week after week after week for years, um, this is not the woman I married. That's the famous line I keep on hearing. She's nothing like herself. Well, how, how could you make such a personality shift? How could it be that dramatic? What happens literally is the personality, the troubled personality of the mother takes over the girl's personality. Literally, it throws it out. And now her body is possessed by her mother's complete value system, quirks, ways, methods, beliefs, rebellions, everything. And now the man's suddenly sitting there with with a woman he didn't marry. That's starting to freak me out because that's exactly... What happened? I mean, I literally woke up one day and said, who on earth? And it was like a month into the marriage. We had dated for five years. And and then the day we got married, it was like a a switch was flipped, literally. Were you in your 30s? She was a different person. I was in my 30s, early 30s. Okay. And And it was like, wait a minute, what just happened? Like, this isn't the person that you were two days ago. Like, what happened? And it never changed. It only got worse. It only got worse. That's right. What the... (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, I'll tell you, I mean, if it, I just want, I'll share this personal story and, and you can tell me your thoughts. So I'm raised, uh, my parents are divorced when I'm six. My mother takes me and my brother to New Hampshire from California, leaves my dad in California and says, see you later. And he's heartbroken. We're heartbroken. 
and we only see him two months out of every year for my entire life. And so uh, we're distraught. We All we want to do is be with our dad, but we can't be. So we hate my mother. You know, I hate my mother. I'm angry towards her for years and years and years, resentful. And, um, and, and so, you know, I have all these issues with that. My ex-wife, on the other hand, raised in an extremely conservative, devout Catholic family, which has got a million brothers and sisters, very conservative. They're mass every day. The Catholic schools all the way. Mm. My dad, I'd go to his house on the summers. I was, you know, 10, 11 years old. There'd be playboys, you know, sitting in the bathroom. Uh, like yeah. we could do whatever the hell we wanted. You know, it was like all we did was play sports, go to baseball games. You know, there was no discipline. And, um, and so, yeah, so we got together and, and, you know, the dating was great. Mm. And as soon as we got married, she turned into her mother, like this devout Catholic <laughs> person. I'm like, wait a minute. We just spent five years together and we didn't do any of this stuff. Like you didn't tell me you expected me to make, expected me to be the spiritual leader of the household. You didn't expect me to, to like, whoa, 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 whoa. There it is. There it is. Right there. And, and, and we stuck it off for eight and a half years and it was tough. Uh, I mean, uh, within the first month, I was crying myself to sleep thinking, what did I get myself into? I'm trapped and I, I'm not getting a divorce because I'm not going to be my dad. I'm not going to do this. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not going to do this to my kids. I had two little girls. I said, I can't, I'm not repeating history. And lo and behold, uh, when my kids were almost the exact same ages that my brother and I were, when, when my parents split, we split. And my dad's a great guy. Uh, you know, he wasn't an active part of, of disciplining me or anything like that or teaching me life lessons. And so I just said, I'm not going to be you know, that type of dad, like I'm going to be super engaged and I'm going to help them with every aspect than I am. So when you said that earlier, it makes me think, you know, if we're consciously aware of we are our, our fathers or become our fathers, can we do something to change that? If we know that, that we're repeating those patterns, can we say, you know what, I'm not going to do the, those particular things. And instead I'm going to do something else. So here's uh, where, the, where this is leading uh, which, which is a, a great, a great, uh, a great thing. That your your fo- your story is focusing us in a great, uh, a great direction. Uh, so, so here you are. Uh, you were raised in a the broken home. That means you're programmed to be in a broken home. That means that your marriage, your intimate relationship, is gone. It is literally set up to be broken. And so that urging that you get as you get older is going to be urging you to break it up. Why? Because you're programmed to break it up, right? So what you had is you had a mother who says, I'm going to get as far away from you with my children as possible. Why? Because your value system is so sucky and so bad that I'm going to leave you in California and I'm going to go to the opposite side of the country so I can stay away from you, right? So that's what what Mm happens. And she doesn't care at all, at all, that you are losing your father. Doesn't care. Now, why doesn't she care? Because she's raised to not care. If you look at her mother, you could tell us a story of her mother, right? Mm -hmm. True? Yep. And if you think in terms of her mother and say, was her mother insensitive? (laughs) Yes. She or her mother was insensitive, right? Yes. All right. What do you think is going to happen to her when she marries you? She's going to become insensitive. An insensitive Catholic specifically, where rules and regulations and requirements are more important than sensitivity to feelings and emotions. Why? Because that's what mother was. So, you know, when you're meeting a girl, uh, and I I always tell guys this, if if you're going to move away from your wife and you're going to start searching for another woman, the most important question you can ask while you're dating that woman is tell me all about your mother in your childhood. Tell me stories about your mother in your childhood. And if the first thing you hear is, I don't remember my childhood, you need to say, uh, check please. <laughs> because, because a woman who doesn't remember her childhood has a black box childhood. That means all the pain is buried in a black box and she can't remember it. And so what happens is out of the black box, once you marry her, out it comes. And so that's what happened to you. The, all the religious requirement Catholicism came out of her, and she slapped you with a religious uh, order that you had to live in. 
Mm-hmm. And you were so not ready for that. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I wasn't. I mean, I don't want to go into too many details. Right, right. But, well, you know, you know when, we it, get, when we get into details, what it does is it just visualizes more painfully how true this is. Right? That's what the details do. They, they visualize how painful this is. Yeah. And so I mean, if you, it, want, you want to know your future, ask about the, the, the mother. Because the mother is what you're marrying. You're marrying the mother. Yeah. I mean, I will say that, no, uh, I mean, her mother was a great woman. She was uh, a, um, a teacher and a principal of a Catholic school. I was always really close with her family. Um, they, I mean, they were solid people, but extremely on, on one side of, you know, everything. Everything begins with God, and every conversation I had ultimately turned kind of into a sermon about yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. And so— I was raised with zero religion, none. I did convert to Catholicism before I got married because that's what I felt I like I needed to do to get married in the Catholic Church and become part of that faith for her. And and so I never really bought into, I mean, you just can't one day wake up and say, all right, I believe in all of these things in the Bible, and you know, and so— It had, it had your mind, it didn't have your heart. Correct. And so, you know, I, I wanted to believe, I wanted to get into it, but I just, you know, my, my upbringing, I just never had— in my life, never. So, so you, um, you think about your father. Your father was a charismatic, uh, uh, very uh, easygoing, happy guy, right? He liked to have fun. Is that who who your dad was? Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely laid back and you know, kind of uh, routine, routine, routine oriented, but. Um, very studious. PhD is professor uh, and researcher at UCLA for forty years extremely intelligent, kind of a lab rat, um, almost, I mean, I hope he doesn't listen to this, but a little bit nerdy, but (laughs) he loves sports. He loves playing sports. He's extremely active. He's he's 72 now and he's, he still exercises for three hours a day. Um, (laughs) but yeah, it was all fun and games when we were together. There was never, Hey Steve, you screwed up with this, do this. It was, let's go to the games. Let's, you know, and so we didn't have that. All of our discipline came from our mother who was trying to handle two boys in a tiny apartment and we wanted no part of it, and so she had to deal with that. And, yeah. and it was it was tough. I mean, she had it tough. So so there it is. So how do we attract who we attract? And so here's the phenomenon. I, I've done over 1,600 interviews uh, of people in troubled marriages about their childhood. And so I've got all of this big database of, mm-hmm. uh, of these, these, these great truths. And, uh, and one of the great truths is, how do we attract who we attract? And it turns out that we are attracted to the people who have matching childhood pain. Now, we do not know that, and we don't even want to learn that. But that's what we do. We attract who is, like, for instance, if you met a woman and you got to you know, meet her a little bit and there would be a sudden attraction, the reason there would be a sudden attraction is because she has matching childhood pain to yours. Hmm. It's a phenomena that just blew my mind because I heard it over and over in every single story, matching childhood pain. So let's say you meet a woman and there's just no, there's no chemistry there. There's no, uh, no sparks. There's nothing, right? Uh-huh. And you look at her childhood and yours in any depth and you'll realize she does not have matching childhood pain to you. Weird. So no attraction, no attraction. So I'll give you this example and you'll probably say, see, this is what I'm talking about. But um, a year after my separation, I uh, reconnected with an old friend who had been married and when I was married and we kind of got back together and clicked, right? We've been together now for for a number of years. We live together. We have a phenomenal relationship on pretty much every level. And here's her backstory. She's Korean. She was adopted when she was a baby by white parents who brought her over here and adopted three other Koreans, and they had three children of their own. And they took the four Korean children, starting at age maybe five or six, and they owned a farm, and they put them out in the farm, more or less for slave labor, and they worked them from dusk till dawn. And her childhood was horrible. Like, mm-hmm. there were no vacations. There were no trips. There was, It was like, you're going to work all day long, and then you're going to go to bed. There was nothing. Like, And she worked her ass off. She... Uh, I mean, her work ethic now, she has a, a really good job. She she does very well. And uh, she's probably the hardest worker I've ever met. And she's got this just personality. She's just type A across the board. Like, 
Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, she doesn't want to be around her family because the the association of you know her childhood was so shitty. She didn't have a childhood; like she was an employee. And she has to basically break free of her parents when she was 18. She put herself through college uh, while working full time and, uh, you know, has really kind of a, a self-made person. And so, you know, when you said that, I never thought about that. Like she's had a lot of childhood trauma. I went through some other things that I haven't mentioned that were really painful when as a child. And so I'm like, that's very interesting that you just said that. So, so now, now let's think of it as simply. You're a carrier of the damage of the childhood. And the damage is the messages, the messages and the events. So we have messages of what the programmers said to you, and we have the events themselves, how you were treated. And together, they become abandonment or abuse or neglect or some combination. And there's emotional versions of those three, and there's physical versions of those three. So you see, we've got abandonment, abuse, and neglect, either physical or emotional, and we can mix them up and install them into the child. So you look at your wife, right? Her, mm-hmm. She's abandoned by her biological mother, abandoned by her biological father, all right? That abandonment isn't gone. It's still in her. Mm-hmm. And then she gets some um, Caucasian parents who turn her into a slave and don't give her a childhood, okay? Mm-hmm. All right, so what kind of, biological parents does she have? Well, it turns out that the quirks, the personality, the nature of the biological people go through the sperm and the egg and grow up into the person. Mm-hmm. And so that, that whatever that, those quirks, those leanings, those personality traits, they're all in the, the kid. They're in the kid. But because they're, they're adopted, they're being raised by adoptive parents. And it turns out adoptive parents do not transfer anything to children that they adopt. Nothing's transferred. Hmm. It's amazing. And, and it's astounding. What's in the child is what biologically has been put in the child, not what any raising parents do. So um, for the adopted people that are listening to this, um, your big issue is your biological people. Whoever your biological huh. people are, that's what really matters to you. So if you had troubled biological people, you're going to have trouble you're carrying. Really? I mean, I would have really thought it would be more of a, um, a nurture versus a nature uh, for sure. No, the environments not, not, you grew not up in. For, not for adoption. For adoption, hmm. adoptive parents do not instill any characteristics in the child. Nothing's huh. transferred. It's a really amazing. What's in that child is the biological people, who, whoever wow. they were. And, and that's why people go searching for their parents. You know, when they be, you know, they get older, they, yeah. they go searching for the, the, the biological parents because they want to know, why am I this way? And so they want that grounding and that rooting. So what your wife is carrying is she's carrying uh, two traumas, the trauma of abandonment, and then she's carrying the trauma of slave uh, labor of losing her childhood. And so what she had to become is she had to become the, the super workhorse. And something's driving her. Something's driving her day after day. And, and it became a child story. A child story is really powerful because when you're, you know, you're three years old and you're having a painful experience, you tell the child story, you make a child decision. And when you take, make that child decision, it literally sticks with you all your life. And so she's very driven to beat something, overcome something, mm-hmm. turn something off, turn something away. She's really driven because of the pain. Because she made a child decision back then. And the child decision is really, really powerful because it can so control your life, <laughs> all your life. And if it's a, it's a really, you know, you're, you're making a child's decision, what do you know? You don't know anything. And yet that thing, that decision sticks with you and you keep on repeating it all your life. Wow. That's really spooky. That's interesting. I mean, well, first off, you know, we're, we're not married. Um, we're just in a domestic partnership. You know, we've been together for a number of years, but, um, so she is fiercely independent, um, and has this real kind of wall up where nothing, nothing can hurt me. Like Steve, that's so perfect. That's so perfect. Exactly what she should have for the, for the childhood she was given. Because it turns out she is literally having to process the pain of her childhood every day. Now, here's, here's the wonderful thing. You didn't get married. 
when you don't get married, the programs don't turn on full steam. They don't turn on full steam and go rip roaring because the back door is always open. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. When a license and marriage and law and the state enters your life, boy, does that ever turn on the programming? It really turns it on. You know what's so, interesting? Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but no, go ahead. this is just blowing my mind. Mm -hmm. She dated a man for 10 years, got married, and within a year she was divorced because she felt trapped and unhappy. There it is. is that, there it is. Yeah. The mar marriage, the legal marriage, because remember, when you marry, you marry the person and the state. So it's a three-way relationship. You're married to the state, you're married to the person, and you are now in a three-way relationship. Now, when you're living in a, a non-married uh, relationship, the door is always open. You can always leave, right? And so the courts don't protect non-married people. Why? Because they're too busy taking care of the married people. Mm -hmm. The married people are here to argue with the state, right? The mm -hmm. state is here to interfere, right? What do you think no-fault divorce was made for? No-fault divorce was created in the 1970s because the courts were sick of people fighting about their emotions. And it was using up all kinds of court time. And so Ronald Reagan signed the first no-fault divorce law. And what did no-fault divorce do? It said, hey, quit arguing and just break up. Mm -hmm. And the family, that's what it did. Because the courts couldn't handle the arguing. They couldn't settle anything. And so when you don't marry, you don't turn on that last key that turns on the pressure of childhood uh, pain. So the childhood pain is not turned on full fledged. So I shouldn't get married then. <laughs> well, because well, think about think about why do you get married? Why do you get married? You get married because women want to be married because they want financial protection. Yes. Men don't marry for that reason. Men don't right. even want weddings. Weddings are girl parties. They're not for men. Men don't want weddings, right? Women want their girl parties. Yeah. Right. So women want marriage because marriage gives security. Guaranteed security, guaranteed by who? By the state. Yeah. Right? That's why. So when you look at who you're who you're living with, you're living with a really strong, ambitious woman. And her ambition and her drive is doing something to you. Now, if you were married, it would do a lot more. But hmm. it's it's doing something to you right now. It's influencing you. It's affecting you. It's uh it's moving you in a direction. I mean, she was the person that, that got me started down the path to turning my life around and ultimately starting my own business. I mean, she was like my cheerleader, like my rock. And, there it is. There it is. See, and she, she doesn't need me financially. She, she out earns me for sure. And, and so she doesn't need me for anything like that or security or anything like that. I mean, what we have is perfect. We've rarely even spoken about marriage. It's just why, like, See, Why do we need to do that? You don't have a reason to be married because women need marriage for financial security. Yeah. And so what she is, is she is a farm laboring child who made her own security as she, as she had to. And so she's good at it now in her adult life. And so what you did is you attracted an independent woman who doesn't have a whole bunch of rules and restrictions and everything. What, you're, what you have is a woman who's more of a coach to you than your first wife was. Your first wife was basically a long form Catholic mass in Latin. <laughs> <laughs> so something like that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. She needed me. I was everything. Like I was supporting the family completely. And um, she needed that, you know, I don't want to talk too much about more about her, but it's fascinating, you know, just I'm sure people listening to can resonate with some of what I'm saying is, I would have never thought because my ex and the one I'm with now are polar opposites from but, the way they look to the way they talk, act, the backgrounds. I mean, everything is just completely different. So, so now that you've uh, made an opposite, right, and uh -huh. you, you, you actually stepped into a relationship where marriage is not necessary. Uh -huh. And when marriage is not necessary, you don't go into what marriage does. Marriage turns up programming to a really high level. Now, why do we get attracted to people who have matching childhood pain? And the reason is because we learn when we're in pain. You know, thousands of mm -hmm. years ago, Paul the Apostle said, I would rather you not marry because when you were married, you will have troubles. 
<laughs> mm-hmm. Imagine that on a wedding cake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you're married, they you will have trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but that's why do you have troubles? Because we have for centuries attracted our matching child with pain. And when the pain matches, there's going to be trouble. You know? Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm abandoned emotionally. Marsha's abandoned emotionally. That's our matching childhood pain. And so when we would have fights, what would that abandonment do? It would turn on that pain. And we would argue and fight to create that abandonment all over again. So Hmm. we were forced to relive the abandonments of our parents, the emotional abandonment of our parents. Oddly enough, both our parents stayed married and miserable. And so we're programmed to stay married and miserable. Why did I go 27 years of hell? You know, in my story, 27 years of a marriage made in hell, but in 28th year, I fell in love with my wife. Why was that 27 years? So why did I not leave? Because I couldn't leave. Because the program wouldn't let me. That's how powerful programs are. You can't leave them. You can't, you can't step away from them. You can't control them. You can't turn them off until you start to really learn what they're made of. And so I want to go to this next idea uh, called against energy. And against energy is the killer of the human race. And what is against energy? Against energy is being against anything, anything or anyone. Uh, I'm against the barking dog outside who wakes me up every morning. Uh, I'm against the driver who drives really slow in front of me and I mm-hmm. can't get around. Uh, I'm against the, the uh, city for passing that law that makes me put my garbage cans in this place. I don't want to put mm-hmm. them. You know, there's all kinds of things. And when you look around the world, you see against energy is running everything. Mm-hmm. Now, it's obvious to start in politics, which is loaded with against energy, but there's against energy in everything. It's in sports. It's in religion. It's in education. It's literally everywhere. It's in houses. It's in families, brothers, sisters, arguing. What are they arguing about? They're against something. And it feels good to be against. So against energy is the killer of the human race because when you're against things, you literally become possessed by what you're against. So for instance, when you were at the peak of your marriage pain, Mm -hmm. you were against the family value system of that family Mm -hmm. because it was making you suffer. Mm -hmm. Why? Because your value system was nothing like that. Isn't that really what it came down to? Yep. Right? Look at my yep. value system. My value system was, hey, I live for myself. Right? What's her value system? You have to work and serve. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's so interesting. Um, one of the biggest areas of contention was I uh, I got a job in finance that I didn't particularly love, but it was good on paper. It paid the bills. It was stable. It had good insurance. And hmm. after a number of years, uh, it was a pure living hell for me to go to my office. I hated the work. I just, it just didn't enjoy it at all. It sucked the life out of me. But the conversation at home was too bad. Suck it up. <laughs> this is what people do. People don't, aren't, you don't need to like your job. You just have to do it. There it is. And I said, no, 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 no. That's not how you're supposed to live your life. Life is too short for that. You can find something that you love and you can make that your vocation. I believe that with all my heart. I mean, I'm doing it now. But she's like, no, 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 no. You're in this marriage. You know, this is what you need to do. Go to work, bring home a paycheck, raise your kids, pay the bills, pay off the SUVs. <laughs> I said, no, that that's not right. That's not right. <laughs> uh, that's one of about 15 things that we yes. just couldn't. Yes. But so, yes. so, you know, when you think about your future, just think about the value systems. She gets the value system mostly from her mother. You get your value systems mostly from your father. And when you think about your father and you think about how he was in your childhood during those two weeks that you were imprinted by him. Two months. Or two months. Yeah. Or yep. Two months you were imprinted by him. Yep. Every year you were imprinted by your father every two months. Right? Yep. And this is your biological father. So this is the real deal. Because you remember you have all of his traits and stuff through the biology. As a, as as a, you know, because you have two months with him every year in your childhood, so that's what is it doing? It's reinforcing the biological imprint of his values and his quirks and so on. And so, when you look at your father's system, and you look at her mother's value system, 
and asked the question, could I get my Yale professor to go live with her Catholic mother for a year? Mm -hmm. What would have happened? It would not have been a good match. Yeah. And so, you know, what we, what we don't want to do is what we, as I'm saying, the world doesn't want to do is we do not want to acknowledge that we carry these values inside us. And when we go into an intimate relationship and we marry, they all turn on full force. And what happens? Lots and lots of real-time adult pain. Lots and lots. Wow, but, that's so interesting. But we are in the divorce culture. And now being divorced isn't even a stigma anymore. And the divorce culture only began in the 1970s. That's all. So we are in the, 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 the fast-paced divorce culture. You're not in a stigma if you're divorced. There's no stigma. Mm-hmm. Yep. All the children at school, you know, Seventy uh, percent of them come from divorce homes, right? And so the the teachers, the reason the teachers get paid so well, is because <laughs> they have to deal with our troubled kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, there's we're still talking about divorces here, and we haven't gotten to the the marriage part of it, uh, like people that are married and are. are looking to improve their marriages. And, and there's so many questions I have in here, but one of the main things that I want to talk to you about is, you know, we're, we're going through this marriage, right? And I'm thinking no chance I'm leaving this because I'm not doing what happened to me. Like I just, I can't do that, but it got so bad. And I was literally thinking I'm going to have a heart attack from stress if I don't leave the situation because we couldn't communicate. We went through therapy and counseling and workshops, everything you could think of for years didn't help. And, uh, and why would so, they, the values were intact. The yeah. Values I mean, they were intact. There was no way the values were moving and they were not moving. No, they, they weren't moving. I mean, they, they weren't. And they were insisting, <laughs> they were insisting yes. the values were. Yeah. So, so, so finally we made the decision mutually. All right, this is, this has got to uh, change. And so I moved out and, um, and so, uh, you know, my thought, and I know you've heard this a million times is, the girls, they're, they were seven and four at the time where we split, that I would rather have them in two separate households with two happy parents individually than one family unit, miserable, anxious, angry, a lot of um, unspoken angst and just n- tons of negative emotions. Like I'd come home and she'd leave, you know, and we didn't speak and we didn't really fight. We never yelled at each other. We just didn't talk. It was past all of that it was just like you know whatever just i don't even care anymore and so i didn't want them learning that that it was okay to be in a relationship like that like that's not how you should be so we split and um you know today it's been it's been six years since i was uh divorced but you know the household now i have my girls every weekend um our house is it's loud it's fun it's the girls are are very close to, to the woman i'm with and it's a completely different environment. Like they love it. It's so supportive and like we have fun and we do all kinds of, you know, fun stuff, hikes and all, you know, kayaking and like it's, it's experiences and, and, but there's so much love. Like we talk to them a lot, like on deep levels. And, um, to me, that's, that's so much more important than just grinding out and sticking and what, it out what for happens the sake when of they go to their mother's house? Uh, it's a different story. Um, she is still the same person, hasn't really evolved as a person. She still carries a lot of anger and uh, she blames me. She's still the victim. So she blames me for basically ruining her life and taking her out of this quote unquote perfect life with the picket fence house. And, you know, she didn't have to work. She could stay with the kids and, you know, do whatever the hell she wanted, what she was doing. And I took that away from her. And so she's never been able to accept responsibility for any of that. And so she can't stand me. She makes it very clear to the kids um, what she thinks of me, and it's not good for them. We don't talk poorly ever about her. So um, what are, what's their lives like with their mother? Um, we know what life is like with dad. Yeah, their house is filled with a lot of yelling, anger. Um, the boundaries are not there. They're disrespectful. Um, she's constantly melting down emotionally, crying, falling apart. Um, blaming everybody, everything. Okay, so here's what's going to happen. Your girls are going to grow up, and who are they going to attract for their intimate partner? They're going, to inter- they're going to attract somebody who's going to help recreate that home. 
What is that home? It turns out it's going to be like your childhood. Your, your childhood was like a fun dad, but it was only for two months. Yeah. The fun dad with your mother for the rest of the time, right? Yep. But you can, when you compare your father's two month house with your mother's, you know, 11 month house or mm-hmm. nine month house. Yep. And you, you look at the contrast and you look at where your girls are growing up in now mm-hmm. and you go and, and, and they're just, they're seeing you more often, but what are you creating? You're creating a fun house, mm-hmm. a happy house, right? Yep. And what is she creating? She's creating a sad house. Mm-hmm. Well, those girls are going to, in their intimate relationship, they're going to reproduce this sad life and this happy life, which feels like manic depressive, doesn't it? Yes. Manic, two extremes. Yep. Polar, right? Mm-hmm. Bipolar. Why? Why is it called bipolar? Because yeah, when I go north, I'm I'm really unhappy, and when I go south, I'm really happy, and then I just go between happy. Why? Why are you like this? Well, because I can't control my emotions. Why? Well, because I had to go live with my mother who made me sad. And then I go and live with my father and it made me happy. And so now I'm programmed to be happy and sad. Oh, I think we have drugs for that. <laughs> right? How do we, that's, that scares the hell out of me. How do, how do we avoid that? Um, I don't want that to happen to them. It, it's not about avoiding. It's about the idea of against energy. Against energy, uh, what's the, the law of attraction? is a very simple law. If you look at it, it comes to you. That's the law of attraction. If you look at it, it comes to you. So what does that mean? Um, it, it's, uh, there's another quote that I want to give you that's like that. It says, when you pay attention to something, you buy it because the currency of the universe is energy. That's the quote I was talking about. When you, mm-hmm. when you pay attention to something, you buy it. And what that means is like when you go in a store and you're looking at everything, you're not buying, you don't have it until you exchange currency for it. When you give the currency, they give you the item, and now you've bought it, right? Well, in the life that we live in this world, we pay attention to something, and we immediately buy it. It literally attaches to us. So what if against energy is part of your life, and you're against things? Things, whatever you don't like, you're against it. Mm -hmm. You foment on it. You think about it. You dwell on it. You worry about it. You you get uh, innerly angry, right? What's happening? Mm -hmm. You are now buying it. You're buying it because you're against it. And so if you're against anything, it literally attaches to you. And so this is what your daughters have to learn. Your daughters have to learn is that in their childhood, they had a happy home and an unhappy home. And now they're destined in their lifetime to have a happy home and an unhappy home, a happy life and an unhappy life, happy moments and unhappy moments that are going to literally possess them. And they're going to be tossed between them. And so what happens is they, they are against that. I don't like this. Well, what don't you like? I don't like that I'm going between happy and sad and happy and sad. I don't like this. Well, what are you going to do? Well, your daughters are programmed to blame their unhappiness on somebody else. Mm-hmm. Right? Now, what is going to happen if they don't learn about against energy? They're going to be against whoever their partner is. And so the job is learning how to leave against energy. And that's, that's a work that you have to dedicate yourself to. So when I teach environment changers, that's what I'm teaching. I'm teaching them how to leave the world of against energy. And if we throw it into a visual analogy, uh, you're in the against ocean. The ocean is against energy. And if you're in the ocean, you can always be bitten by sharks. Uh-huh. Indian Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, Pacific Ocean, no matter what ocean you're in, you could always be bitten by sharks. But if you go up onto the beach, then you're out of against energy, and now you're free from sharks. And that's really the life you want your daughters to have. You want them to live free from sharks. Yes. And what are the sharks? Against energy. I'm mad at this. I'm pissed off at this. I'm frustrated by this. I pay attention to it. And what is it? It's negative. I'm paying attention to negative. So what am I going to get in the law of attraction? I'm going to get negative. If you pay attention to it, you buy it. So that's really the job that you can teach them about the two homes that they're programmed in. You can so teach them about like? well, well, so what is, what, I need to learn about it first, right? I mean, well, I need to yeah, understand yeah, against energy. Yeah, you, you, you have to learn first because 
whenever you start to talk about against energy and teach about against energy or explain against energy, oh, this is against energy. I don't want to do that. Right? That's not a good. I don't want to be against that. Right? So the idea is leaving against energy by going to acceptance number one, then to gratitude number two, and then to appreciation number three. So here's the here's the little steps of how to do that. So how do you get out of against energy? The first thing you do is you accept what it is you were against. So let's say you were um, uh, your current relationship. Uh, her most unattractive thing is she she is too um, overwhelming, pushy uh, into your details. You, you don't want her in your details. Let's say that was it. And so um, I, I hate when she gets into the details of my situation and she wants to tell me what to do all the time. Right? Mm-hmm. So you start with acceptance. I accept that she wants to knows her way into the details of my life. I have the second statement. I have gratitude that she wants to, to knows into the details of my life because I learn from pain. And this is the pain that teaches me. The third step is appreciation. Appreciation comes with a question. The appreciation question is, what do I love about you? And so then the third step is to say, what do I love about you? And so whatever you were against, you're now saying, what do I love about you? <laughs> you have to come up with that, mm-hmm. right? Um, I, what I love about you is you have made me a better person. What I love about you, number two, you uh, are so fun to be around uh, most of the time. <laughs> and number three, uh, uh, you make me feel better about myself. You know, let's say you come up with those three things. Well, what you have done by going through those three steps of acceptance, gratitude, and appreciation, you have now lost your against energy on that topic. And it's a practice. It's a thing you practice. Because you're now aware of the killer of the human race. What makes people sick? Emotion, dark emotions. Against energy creates dark emotions. All right. So let me give you this example. And you, it's ironic that you mentioned it earlier, but... I'm a, I'm a really laid back person, but there's one thing that angers me every single day and it's driving. So we're, there's tons of traffic here. I'm close to DC in Baltimore. There's a ton of traffic out here and I drive a fair amount and it, it angers me to no end when people you know, pull out in front of you when you're going 50 and they go zero or they won't get out of the left-hand lane when they're going 60, when they sh- when everyone else is going 80. Mm-hmm. Like that stuff didn't used to bother me as much, but lately, even the last six months to a year, I almost embrace it. Like I enjoy the feeling of getting pissed off and I'll aggressively ride up on their car. I mean, I will mm-hmm. do everything and everyone's like, dude, you're going to get shot. You better back off. Mm-hmm. And I said, no, no one's going to shoot me. I, I said, I don't care. I, these idiots need to get off the road. And it's, I don't, I don't like, you know, I get angry in the car, but it's like, it's like, I like the feeling of the anger. Um, it doesn't, I'm not like worried. Oh, what if I crash or what if they shoot me? Like, uh, you know, and I don't, it's obviously not a healthy thing to do. Um, But like, so how do I take something like that that has, I would say it has control of me. Like I can't leave my house and get on the road without getting pissed off. I don't ever take a trip and not get pissed off at some idiot on the road. Okay. So So now the question, well, now the question is, um, Mm -hmm. is this helping me personally? Because I, when I get on the road, I'm the punisher. Yes. That's what I do. I'm the punisher. And I like to be the punisher because it makes me feel righteous. I'm the righteous driver. Yes. And, I, and I punish you people because you're <laughs> bad drivers. Right? Yes. So, so here's what you have. You have a drug. You're being drugged with. Okay. And the drug is self-righteousness. But you don't see it that way. Because, you know, just the story you told, you see that you are taking the role on the road as the punisher of bad mm-hmm. drivers. Yes. It makes you feel very good because the righteousness feels very good. I'm better than you. I'm a better driver. I could teach you how to drive. But in the meantime, I'm going to run you off the road. Okay. (laughs) That's against energy right there. Okay. Yes. Now against energy has a price. When you let it in, it comes to separate you from people and slowly, keyword, slowly destroy you. Against energy separates you from people and slowly destroys you. Okay. Now you don't know how that happens. You don't know how it happens. You can't see it. It's too subtle, but that's what it does. 
Now, if we think in terms of health, um, what does against energy do? Against energy increases stress. Mm -hmm. And there's whole books about stress, right? Mm -hmm. Against energy is the originator of stress. So when you're the punisher, you have to live under stress. And that's going to affect your health physically because you're first going to be affected emotionally. So you have to ask yourself, do I have a reward for becoming a relaxed, easygoing driver? Is there a reward in it for me? Well, yeah, I'm going to live longer because I'll have less stress. And this punisher job, um, you know, I know that's a short-term high, but boy, it's a long-term pain. So I'm not being rewarded by being the punisher on the road. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the acceptance, gratitude, and appreciation steps while I'm driving. And I'm going to do that for five days and see what happens to me. Okay, that's, the, that's what you're doing. So when you run into a bad driver that you qualify as a bad driver and you say, um, I accept this bad driver. Okay. Then the second step, I have gratitude for this bad driver because I learned from pain and this is the pain that teaches. And then the third step, appreciation. What's the appreciation question? What do I love about you? Okay. What do I love about you, bad driver? What mm -hmm. I love about you is that uh, you are on the road and you're driving a car that you have to pay insurance for. And you have to have some level of prosperity because you have a car. And, you know, in the world, there's a lot of people who don't have a car. Millions of people don't own a car. And the fact that you own a car is a sign of prosperity. In fact, the more cars we have, the more prosperity we have as a society. So I really love that you're part of a prosperity society. And so you make up stuff, literally, in the, in the what do I love about you question. You make up stuff. Mm -hmm. And what does that force you to do? It forces you to be positive. Right? Mm -hmm. And so acceptance, gratitude, appreciation, literally one issue at a time. It's so it's so interesting. I mean, I know this the show has been a lot of uh personal stories and I know guys can hopefully relate to a lot of different things. I didn't mean to make this about me, but um But there's great know, illustration. Story, great illustration yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's it's so funny that you used the comparison because I have a Punisher shirt, which I don't have any other shirts. <laughs> <laughs> to do with anything except the Punisher. Two, oh. I'm constantly saying that's not right. Like <laughs> to me, people that are doing morally wrong things or even, you know, idiot drivers, that's not right. It's like in my mind, I want it to be right. Like it's when people are doing bad things, it's not right to do that. Um, so it's, it's so bizarre that you said that. And I'm like sweating and shaking here thinking of, <laughs> of not rolling up on somebody and getting pissed off because it's so ingrained now that like I, I turn on Slayer and I just, I jam Slayer out and, and I ride hard. I don't speed, like I'm not like weaving in and out of traffic trying to kill somebody and definitely not with the kids, but it's always someone that's going to pull out and do something dumb. It just always happens. So now let's, let's look at the law of attraction. Let's imagine the law of attraction is a giant magnet that's a thousand miles tall floating in the sky. Okay. And the magnet floats over you and it says, Hey, we're checking in on Steve today. Uh, what's, uh, what's Steve focused on today? Oh, he's focused on against energy. Well, let's give him more of it. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's it. <laughs> it just drives me crazy. And, uh, my mother was uh, the opposite. Like she would, be, I'd be in the car with her. I remember, and people would cut her off, and she'd be like, "Oh, you know, that maybe they're in a hurry," or you know, she'd always have some other way to look at it. And I admired that. But you know, me as a driver, I'm finding it nearly impossible to do the same thing. Uh, do you know what you're uh, actually explaining here? You're explaining the bucker concept, B U C K E R, like a bucking bronco. Okay. What happens when you grow up and you're angry at what your mother did, the way she drove, the way your father handled discipline, the way anybody did anything, it, it angered you and you say, I'm never going to be like that. That's called a bucker. And a bucker, what a bucker has to do is they get the tendencies of the programmers to mm -hmm. come up and they say, no, I'm not doing that. I'm doing this instead. Right? That's what bucker yeah. has to do that over and over and over again. And it's really exhausting. Because you can't ever really relax because you're bucking all the time, right? So a bucker has to be against things just to survive. And so the Punisher is a great bucker image because the Punisher has to punish all the wrongness that you see in the world. Yes. That's so weird that you said that. 
uh it's just so bizarre that, that that you made that one reference and that's literally what i <laughs> have and what i how i view the world or at least people driving you know on the roads anyway so yeah but, the, but, the, but the theme is against energy is the problem against energy yes. is what's going to hurt your kids so you don't want your that. kids to hurt but they're going to hurt because they're growing up in two programming systems a fun one and a painful one and so now they are going to have to deal with this now in their lifetime. But if they never learn about against energy, they're going to suffer because against energy is going to come for them and they're not going to know what's happening or why. But against energy is a problem. So what I do, and, and you can tell me your thoughts, and I'm sure a lot of other dads do the same thing, but you know, they come on the weekends, you know, we have a great weekend and then come Sunday night. Usually it's been my little one. She's 10 now. She starts to have a, a change in her total attitude she starts to get a little bit down and gloomy and then come sunday night before you know she has to go to bed and get up for school uh she starts to cry and she's i don't want to leave i don't want to leave you guys i don't want to go back to mom's house and so you know we talk to her we don't say shut up and go to bed it's we talk her through it you know you know why is that tell me about you know what's going on and she's actually seeing somebody right now a counselor who's trying to help her through some of you know, the anxieties that she has attached to, you know, her mother. And she started to really rebel against her mother and disrespect her. And she's like a different child at her house. And so I hear these things and I'm like, you're kidding. Like, she would so never do that this, in my house. This is the, but this is classic stuff. So you think about the house that you've created for your children is the happy house. Yes. That makes you feel like the guy who's doing the right thing. Yes. Your enemy over on the other side of town, the mother... She is the problem. She's making the children unhappy. And so there's a, there's a self-righteousness about that. It's just yes. like matched. It's installed in the, in the material. And yeah. so your children are stuck between two value systems that are really dramatic. Yes. And they're paying an emotional price for this. But the thing you want to do is remember that you cannot protect your children from emotional pain. You can't protect them. You can't protect them to the point where they don't experience emotional pain. They're going to experience emotional pain. That's not the problem. The problem is, what am I teaching my children about emotional pain? What am I teaching mm -hmm. them? Mm -hmm. Right? And if I don't teach them about against energy and freeing themselves from against energy, I haven't really freed them from the problem. And we already know what problem your kids have. They have these two value systems, and now when you've given this uh, Sunday night uh, problem, uh, what are they doing? They're going back to the dark side of the program. Mm -hmm. Right? And it's yeah. not, you know, your, your wife's not at fault. You know, she's not, Hey, clean up your life, mm -hmm. get it, clean up your life and get happy. She can't do that. Right. She doesn't know how she's not in a place where she wants to learn. Her children are suffering. She's blaming it on you. Right. So there's no fixing her. It's got to be with your children to learn about against energy. And that's got to come from you. And like, if you defeat against energy in the driving story, if you free yourself from against energy in the driving story, you'll have a story to tell that you can teach your children. But you've got to experience it yourself. You've got to experience acceptance, gratitude, appreciation, and exercises over and over again in different environments to start to say, hey, I, I'm really doing this. I'm having an experience with this, and this feels good. So, okay. I mean, that, that makes perfect sense. And, it, you know, in my mind, when, you know, the kids are going through emotional struggles, you know, we don't blame we don't we don't ever say uh, she's a bad mother we never do anything like that it's it's more of yeah i'm not sure you know you know why she would say something like that or you know maybe she's struggling with something and so you know we're not trying to teach them at all that she's at fault i'm like you know, it's not i don't believe she's the problem i believe like you just said she's got some issues that she's not willing to accept and i can't fix her nobody can fix her um and so that's that's her like it's you know, she is not the problem causing the problems with the kids. It's, it's, it's everything. But by, at the same time, I feel like, you know, it's a, it's the safe haven for them here. And, um, I feel great about it. Like they can come and they can just like their whole energy just, just goes to a different place. And it's like this huge sigh of relief. Like they don't have to worry about getting yelled at or, you know, all the stuff that they, they have to hear there. So, so what you're saying is you're saying, I'm programming my daughters to be happy sometimes. I've programmed my daughters to be happy sometimes. And because I've programmed them to be happy sometimes, I feel really good about the work I've done to feel happy sometimes. 
And now the question is, when they go into their dark times, their mother's programs, Mm -hmm. what are they going to do when those come? I love that they're going to be happy whenever they're having father memories and father moments, because I've done a good job of showing them how to be happy. Mm -hmm. But when they go into their mother's dark times, what can I teach them to free themselves from that dark energy? And that's really what you're asking yourself now. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's why, you know, my little one is seeing somebody, like, I don't have the answer. I mean, I don't know how to make it, I mean, I just don't know how to change the situation. Like, they're in the situation, um, and... The answer's, you know, not feel... out, the answer's not out there, Steve. It's in here. It's in here for you. It's in here for your kids. It's in here. The answer's in here. And what is in here? Acceptance, gratitude, and appreciation is in here. It's not out there. See, <laughs> we live in a world that's really out there oriented. We want to fix the problem out there. You want to fix the drivers out there. You want to fix the mother out there, right? But the problem mm-hmm. isn't out there. It's in here. Because when you have against energy in here, you're going to pay, you're going to pay for it at any age, at 10, at 20, at 80. <laughs> at any age, you're going to pay for it against energy. And until you start to learn to free yourself from against energy, all you'll be focused on is problems that are out there. And the law of attraction will be bringing you more problems out there. More drivers out there, more mothers out there, <laughs> right? So if I if I get rid of that in my life across the board, you're saying that would carry over and ultimately help the girls at their mother's house? Because you're going to be teaching them, here's how to do this. There's always going to be a dark mother wandering around in the, in the world. Mm-hmm. And if you attach yourself with against energy to that dark mother, you're going to suffer. Not because that dark mother exists, but because inside you, you're loaded with against energy that's keeping the pain going. It's inside. It's inside. Acceptance, gratitude, and appreciation is what you do inside. And what it changes, it changes you inside. So the mother doesn't become a painful thing anymore. Hmm. And that's a, that's a, this, this is a concept that uh, they've been trying to teach uh, for thousands of years. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it makes sense. Um, I mean, I'm just trying to, I'm just thinking about this right now. And, you know, I'm willing to do, if I have the tools, I'm willing to do anything I can to to make their lives better or happier or have them avoid any of the things that, you know, maybe I went through or she went through. And, but, you know, in the now, like, you know, what's the last thing you want is to see your children in, in emotional pain. That's right. I mean, you, it you, breaks my heart every just, single weekend. Just, no, you, like, you can't, you can't protect them from emotional pain but you can teach them through emotional pain. And to teach this idea of acceptance, gratitude, and appreciation as a thing you do inside to change how you feel is extremely liberating. Whenever I teach this to parents, uh, especially young kids, they get it right away. They get it right away. Hmm. Wow. I mean, uh, the concept I love, it seems like a a daunting challenge for for people that you know have a, a lot of anger towards each other ex spouses that have a lot of hate or maybe not hate but a lot of negative emotions built up over the years and it's it's not as easy as just well, doing well, the one two three well, step the goal the goal is not easiness the goal is to get the job done the goal is to get the work of acceptance gratitude and appreciation to change how you feel that's the job I've had guys go through this exercise with a pad of paper. They take out a yellow pad of paper and they write their first thing they're against. They write it down and then they write their first acceptance statement, number two. Then they write their gratitude statement out about this subject, number three. And number four, they write their appreciation statement. And then they go on to their next against topic (laughs) and they do it again. And they write it all out and they get like two, three pages of these exercises written out, acceptance, gratitude, appreciation. And they always tell me, that they feel so much better when they're done. <laughs> and there isn't that lingering sting that against energy keeps and holds. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. Just like riding a bike, <laughs> you're going to get good at it. So you, would, so you would say that I would be doing the kids a disservice by... Uh, when I'm driving with them, calling someone an idiot or you know, getting annoyed or angered by... Because you're demonstrating against energy. You're demonstrating, here's what it looks like. You know my happy home I have that I made for you? Well, Mm. it's not happy out here in the world. That's what you're teaching them. Mm. 
You're demonstrating. Here's how unhappy you are on the road. And by the way, your dad is the Punisher. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> now I have a Halloween costume anyway. <laughs> oh, man. So, so man. Anyway, I mean, I, I just looked down at the, the clock here. We've been going for a long time. Oh, and so, this is a, this is a, a lovable topic. <laughs> oh, it really is. I mean, and so we've just scratched the surface, and we've really just started touching on a few things. Um, and so here's my thought and that you can tell me if you're open to this but i would love to bring you back to talk about i mean i literally have a list of topics that i really wanted to talk to you about none of which we got to because this is such a fascinating thing and i hope it helps some people listening but i'd like to invite you back um you know if this show go much longer i think we might start to lose interest because just you know people have only so much bandwidth they can handle before they tune out yes. so if that's uh, uh possible i would love to to but Steve, do this round Steve, two. You, you know what made this so good is that you actually took your life and said, hey, here's my life. How does this work? Right? That's what made it yeah. like so interesting. Yeah, I mean, and I almost feel bad about it, like, you know, but at the same time, you know, it's a, it's a real story, but I know it can relate. You know, I don't try to make my shows all about me and let's <laughs> look at me and look at my <laughs> life, but yeah, I mean, yeah. So Yeah, anyway, I'd be so, glad to. I'd be glad to. I'd love it. Yeah, that would be that would be awesome. So, you know, I appreciate it, um, and let's uh, let's do it again real soon. Okay, uh, we'll and set so, it up. Yeah. So before we jump off, just just for everybody listening, um, where do you want people to find you? So you can save this marriage dot com is your main site. Is there any, anywhere else that you want people it, to yeah, it, find it, out? What it's just it's keep it simple. You can save this marriage dot com uh, because all, all my resources are there, and like I I have a site. It only takes one man dot com. Uh, so, but, but from the, you can save this marriage, uh, that's, that's the place where all my stuff is. Perfect. Okay. And they, um, they can also, uh, uh, Google Larry Bellata on, uh, on YouTube and I have a lot of videos there. So if you, if you enter Larry Bellata in YouTube, B I L O T T A, uh, you'll see all my videos. Sounds good. Okay. I appreciate it. Look forward right. to doing this again. Steve, great. Great. Looking forward to it. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. And remember, if you want more information, check out the Fit Dad Basecamp group on Facebook. And don't forget to stop by fitdadnation.com. Until next time, keep kicking ass and taking the next step. You can do this, Dad. <laughs>